Hey, I'll Scott Horton here to talk to you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State, The Cold War Origins of the Military-Industrial Complex and the Power Elite. In the book, Swanson explains what the revolution was, the rise of empire, and the permanent military economy, and all from a free market libertarian perspective. Jacob Hornberger, founder and president of the Future Freedom Foundation, says the book is absolutely awesome, and that Swanson's perspectives on the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis are among the best I've read. The poll numbers say that people agree on one thing. It's that America is on the wrong track. In the war state, Swanson gets to the bottom of what's ailing our society. Empire. The permanent national security bureaucracy that runs it and the mountain of debt that has enabled our descent down this dark road. The war state could well be the book that finally brings this reality to the level of mainstream consensus. America can be saved from its government and its arms dealers. First, get the facts. Get The War State by Michael Swanson, available at your local bookseller and at Amazon.com. Or just click on the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show here. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, Scott Horton Show. Thanks very much for listening. Check out my website, scotthorton.org. It's new and improved. Got the chat room built right into the page there at scotthorton.org slash chat. Got 3,000 interviews going back to 2003. Uh, we got the old stress blog moved over to the new site. Looking theme sort of a thing going on. And it's still a work in progress, but we're making progress. Very good there, scotthorton.org. And then um, you can also check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at slash scotthortonshow. If you like checking out things. On Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. All right. Next up is our friend David Vine. He's the author of Island of Shame. Man, Island of Shame is right. It's more like the whole world except that island worth of shame. Uh, welcome back to the show, David. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing real well. Thanks for having me back. Uh, very good to have you here. And uh, I should say you write for TomDispatch.com oftentimes. I should not pound on the table while I say that. You write for uh, TomDispatch.com, uh, and thank goodness for that. And recently, you wrote this article about um, the uh, U.S. military buildup in Italy. So a good starting point for this conversation, anyway. Um, that was really kind of mind-blowing. It uh, Maybe this isn't that thoughtful or original or anything, but it made me think that we need to start calling Italy Airstrip 2. Like out of 1984, where uh, England is merely airstrip one, the former nuclear air base of the American Empire, you know? Absolutely. No, and, and uh, you know, Britain has been referred to as the unsinkable aircraft carrier in the, there was during the Cold War and has more or less remained that uh, with some reductions in the post-Cold War era. Um, but Italy is rapidly and in some ways taking its place as as a aircraft carrier or uh, runway for uh, U.S. military intervention uh, far beyond Europe. Well, so what's the problem? Uh, pirates in the Mediterranean there? Um, I think the military in some ways... Uh, doesn't even know, but they want to have increased capabilities of intervention um, from the Africa to the Middle East to the Balkans and Eastern Europe uh, and Italy uh, in the minds of, of military and other officials is a, the perfect lo- location from which to uh, base uh, this, these sorts of intervention forces and, and to launch uh, future interventions. You know, uh, I read this article in defensenews.com, and it's funny, the paragraph, it's so redundant, it's terribly written, but basically, you can't quote it without sounding like a fool, but what it says is that the army, after uh, winding, after getting kicked out of Iraq and winding down in Afghanistan, they're looking for ways to stay globally engaged. In other words, they've got nothing to do. So they form this dagger brigade, and they're going, the dagger brigade, you know, like stab somebody in the back in a cruel kind of underhanded manner. Um, The dagger brigade, and they're going to invade Africa. And so look out, Africans, you're going to get killed. Because here comes the dagger brigade. Because they're looking for ways to stay globally engaged. Because what else are they going to do? Sit around twiddling their thumbs, raping each other all day? Uh, uh, 
yeah. Um, I, I have to I have to go look for that article. Um, well, there's your key words, man. And it's, you know, read it and weep. You know what I mean? It's out of the mouths of babes. They don't know that they're not supposed to say, well, you see, our bureaucratic institutional interest is to find people to kill. And so we're on the lookout. Yeah, I think um, for, for quite a while, uh, the military, especially in, in Europe, uh, beginning with the army, has been looking for uh, things to do, for reasons to, to be there. Um, we're now, you know, more than 20 years uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, and we still have tens of thousands of troops in Europe. Um, those numbers have come down significantly in, in, in recent years, especially. Uh, but, but as many point out, you know, what, what is the army doing in Europe? Um, and increasingly, uh, Africa has become the answer. Uh, no country in Africa is willing to host the headquarters of the U.S. Africa Command to date. Um, so Italy and Germany have basically uh, become the headquarters for the Africa Command as a, as a whole and for uh, different uh, components for each of the armed services. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, if they were trying to come up with a coherent narrative about what they're doing there, they sure don't have one when they're fighting the Mujahideen that really they created accidentally uh, as a matter of blowback in Somalia. They fought for the Mujahideen in Libya and then against them again in Mali, uh, you know, and then chasing Joseph Kony around and all of this. They're just making stuff up, obviously. Well, I think one of the one of the reasons I'm quite concerned is that uh, the military is looking to get in increasingly engaged, as you as you put it, or in using their words, um, which which means intervening increasingly in conflicts around Africa and, and elsewhere. Uh, that the military and the U.S. public, for that matter, and politicians know very little about. I think we've already seen with the the two recent raids in Somalia and and Libya that. Uh, the, the raids have generated a significant uh, anger and outrage uh, that the United States has violated the sovereignty of these two nations. Uh, and any supposed benefits of, of the two raids that, that one might be able to claim, I think, you know, very, very quickly might be outweighed by the, the anger and outrage and, and r frankly, recruitment for, for forces that might wish to do the United States harm uh, that have come about as a result of the raids. Uh, well, the prime the, minister was kidnapped the next day or two days know. later. So talk about blowback. I think it's more like backdraft, just blowing up right in your face. No no secret about what happened here, you know? No, I think that's exactly right. And uh, whether you call it blowback or backdraft, uh, because it's so immediate, uh, I think the, the, the danger is that these sorts of interventions are, are going to create more of the insecurity and mayhem that they're supposedly designed to prevent. You hear that, everybody? I'm coining a phrase. I was going to write an article about it, but it just it wasn't good enough, so I dropped it. But I'm going to get that term into circulation. Backdraft as the, the more immediate, less covert action -y version of blowback. All right, I'll, it worked on you, David. I We're like gonna, it. I like it. I'm carrying this thing through, man. You should go with it. All right. So now uh, I'm going to be quiet for a long time in a row and let you describe what all you learned about the bases. And just go ahead and tell us how many Taco Bells they got and everything you know about the base buildup and how many soldiers and whatever. Did you talk to guys? Did they say what they're doing there? Whatever you got to say. Let's hear Sure. I, for about four years, I've been visiting Italy as part of research for a, a book about U.S. military bases abroad and, and their broad impacts. Uh, and, and Italy has been striking uh, because it just in those four years and, and actually beginning uh, really uh, at the beginning of the, the war on terror, uh, Italy has seen this very significant buildup of, of forces and bases uh, while at the very same time, we've been closing bases, especially in Germany, but closing bases around around Europe. So at the time that we're, we're closing bases and returning facilities to the government of Germany, and actually a, a few in, in Italy, we're, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars um, on new bases, new facilities in, in Italy. So we're seeing essentially a, a shift in the, the center of gravity for the U.S. military in Europe uh, from 
Germany toward Italy. Uh, Germany still remains incredibly important in for the U.S. military, for U.S. military strategy uh, in Europe and, and globally, for that matter, um, with Rammstein Air Base and um, very large training facilities in in the e- east of the former Western Germany. Um, but Italy is come to assume increasingly increasing importance. And one of the uh, bases in particular that I look at in this article at TomDispatch.com is a new base in Vicenza, Italy, uh, where the United States has actually maintained somewhere around six or more bases since the 1950s. Um, the Army came to Congress in about 2006 and said, we need a new base. We need a new base because we have this combat brigade, the 173rd Combat Brigade, that's divided. It's split based between Germany and Italy. And Congress proceeded to turn over uh, about $310 million for a new base in Vicenza. And actually, uh, in total, around $600 million um, for additional construction, as well as a new base around Vicenza, around what they call the Vicenza Military Community. And um, over the next several years, the space grew, and I had a chance to to go visit um, multiple occasions, despite the tremendous opposition of of local people in Vicenza, which is a it's a city, sm- smallish city near near Venice. Um, despite massive local opposition and, and opposition around Italy, um, the Pentagon proceeded with the help of the, the Italian government to build this, this very significant new base. Now, the interesting thing that I, I point out in, the, in this article is that, flash forward to last spring, um, the Pentagon, the Army, they get the keys to the first building in this new base, a um, place called Dal Moline. Um, and they're within months of, of taking uh, ownership over all the all the new buildings in the space. There are about 31 buildings. Um, that same, within weeks of, of, of getting the keys to the, the new base, the Army announces, well, the whole reason that we needed to build this new base to consolidate a brigade in Vicenza, actually we're not going to consolidate in Vicenza. We're going to keep two of six battalions in Germany. So the, the whole justification for the new base, which was to consolidate a brigade in one place, they finally, you know, get six hundred million dollars, they get the base they get the buildings for the base, and then they tell Congress and the American public, actually we take it all back. We're not going to do what we said we're going to do, but we're going to keep the base, of course. So this uh, to me was particularly shocking and, and out, outrageous um, because on the face of it, it looks like the Army really never had any intention of consolidating in Vicenza in the first place, but just settled on a convenient justification that would pry loose hundreds of millions of dollars from Congress to get a new base where they wanted it. Right. Yeah, that's what it always comes down to, it too. You know, you think about all the highfalutin rhetoric about saving innocent lives in Kosovo. Just go look at Camp Bond Steel, a picture from the air in your Google images. And you get the idea that maybe the whole war was fought just so the Halliburton could build that damn thing. Or I guess maybe there's a pipeline there they're pretending to guard or something. Yeah, I think we always have to look at the, the complicated interests that benefit from uh, base construction and the presence of bases, uh, especially in Europe, where you know, as many have pointed out, you know, what what is the military doing there? Who 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 are the enemies? Who is who is Italy's enemy? Who what enemies does does Germany have these days? Uh, is one of the us. That's the whole thing. It's keeping the Germans from building up their own army again. Don't worry, you have us. You have NATO. We'll protect you. Don't rearm. <laughs> Not seriously. You, you can arm yourself up enough to do what we say in Afghanistan, but <laughs> please, that's all. I think that's basically the deal. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's one of the deals. They, 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 yeah, the G- Germany does have a, a quite significant army. Um, uh, but I, I think one of the U.S. Uh, military officials I spoke to in, in Italy was, was quite frank about what the military is doing in Italy. He said, you know, we're not here to defend Italy. I'm, I'm sorry, Italy, he said. We're not here to defend you. We're here because we've decided we want to be here so that we can do other things. Yeah. And you will sell us pizza and do as you're told. 
Yeah, that's the American attitude. I wonder why they call us the ugly Americans, you know? I have no idea, actually. <laughs> Concentrate real hard and see if we can figure that out. All right, so now what's the big deal with this 200 Marines being sent there? Do you think, you know, Patrick Coburn was on the show yesterday, and, you know, he's making a great point, obviously, about um, uh, the media and the Western elites just not paying one whit of attention whatsoever to Libya since the regime changed, since it's such a disaster. And then I was saying, yeah, but be careful what you wish for, because as soon as they start paying attention, they're going to start finding problems to solve over there, you know? And uh, I just wonder what, since, you know, by any measure, it, the, that war has been such a disaster and has just turned the country into lawlessness and um, and warring militias and whatever kind of thing. Do you think this 200 Marines being moved to, to Italy now, that, that just means it's just a matter of days before they're moved to Libya and this whole thing escalates further? Or, I mean, it's sort of like with the Syria thing. We just talked to John Pfeffer. They've got to know better at some point. You've got to cut your losses and not... We were talking about Syria with him. At some point, you got to not do the George W. Bush thing to do, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I... I think uh, on the on the positive side of things, I think the days of large scale interventions, um, uh, at least for the time being, and I hope for the long distant future as well, um, those days are, are over. Um, I think uh, Obama and, and others on Capitol Hill have no interest in sending large numbers of U.S. troops anywhere, and, and that I think that's a real victory on, on the, you know the behalf of people who've opposed the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and and elsewhere. Um, but I, I think there is this danger that small-scale intervention is, uh, in, in, in addition to the use of drones uh, worldwide, that that's the new or major part of the new U.S. military strategy going forward. Um, but I think that the danger is that, that small-scale interventions, of course, can grow into much larger interventions, as we've seen, you know, going back to, to Vietnam and, and, and before. Well, that's um, been my fear about Libya, that, you know, things could really deteriorate there fast. So then, you know, how many suicide bombings or how many ambassadors killed or how many uh, Delta raids that go bad or whatever before they have to really escalate because of all the problems they've created? I mean, that's been their pattern for 100 years running now, you know? Yeah, I think it is really dangerous. Hey, uh, let me hold you through this short break and then uh, ask you more about bases around the world. Sounds great. All right, y'all. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with David Vine. He's the author of Island of Shame. And we've been talking about his piece for Tom Dispatch, which also ran at antiwar.com, the Pentagon's Italian spending spree. And... Uh, so in the book, Island of Shame, which, like I was saying before the break there, is all about the Chagosians who were forcibly, well, they were kidnapped and forced marched across the sea, basically, by the Brits and the Americans uh, who stole their island home from them uh, so that they could have a nuclear bomber base there at Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but in that same book, there's, I guess, a, it's a whole chapter or maybe two or something, all about just America's global empire of bases and of course, it's not the exact same kind of empire as the Roman Empire or the British one, uh, but it is an empire uh, in a great many ways. And when it comes to uh, the power and influence achieved by just having a base in a country where, you know, like we're talking about, even closing it down, they don't want us to close it down just for their immediate economic interests and that kind of thing. Um, they end up having, uh, well, at last count that I saw, it was a thousand something bases. I guess that number fluctuates, but there are, and, and I think the American people still don't really uh, have their heads around this. The American government maintains a thousand military bases outside of the country, all over the world, basically everywhere but Russia and China. We got a base right now. It's crazy. Uh, Dave, could you take us through, could you try to paint a picture of the empire bases? And, and you know what? I don't mean to put a bunch of words in your mouth about to what degree that makes it an empire or not or whatever it is. You characterize it however you want. But also, count up the bases for us. Show us where they are and, and what they're for. Sure. Uh, yeah, this, this, this collection of bases, empire bases, um, that, that you refer to is, is really unprecedented in not just U.S. history, but, but world history. It's a collection of bases that um, outstrips the, the largest collection that, the, as you mentioned, the 
Roman Empire or the British Empire or any previous empire or people ever collected. Um, bases have long been an important part of military strategy um, for empires, for for countries, uh, peoples. Um, but the United States has amassed, really beginning in, in World War II, um, a, a collection that's, that's that's global in scale and and uh, really uh, quite remarkable in in in, in number. Um, there are some bases, of course. It's important to point out that go back to the to the uh, 19th century, including Guantanamo Bay and 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 others um, uh, outside the continental U.S. Um, but it's really in w- World War II that we see the explosion in this number of bases. Um, the number, as you said, fluctu- has fluctuated over time. Of course, during the Cold War, um, reached uh, even higher levels, um, somewhere in the two to three thousand or more range around the world. Um, but you know, again, more than two decades after the end of the Cold War, the United States still maintains hundreds of bases. Uh, it was easily over a thousand until quite recently. Uh, it's a little unclear how many bases remain in in Afghanistan. There were at one point 550 U.S. bases, and that's in addition to NATO bases. Um, but now, the best numbers I've seen is that there remain about a hundred bases in in Afghanistan. So that takes the global total of, of U.S. bases outside the, the 50 states in, in Washington, D.C., um, that total is probably somewhere in the range of 800. Um, still a, a huge collection of, of bases um, with major concentrations still in Europe, especially as, as we've been discussing in Germany and Italy, um, but of course also in, in Japan and South Korea, throughout East Asia. There's all this talk of the, the Asia pivot right now. Uh, the United States has been pivoted to Asia uh, for, for decades. Um, the, we've had uh, hun- literally hundreds of bases um, in, in Japan, South Korea, Guam, um, and throughout East Asia encircling uh, both the Soviet Union during the Cold War, now Russia, um, and, and China. And, and now the Obama administration wants to move more uh, military power in that direction. Uh, but it's also important to point out that there is a growing U.S. military presence in, in Africa proper. Uh, in, the U.S. military will only acknowledge the presence of one base that's in, in Djibouti um, on the continent of Africa, but it's clear that the, the military presence um, is growing, especially with the creation of, of small uh, drone bases and small bases for special forces troops. Sometimes they're run by contractors. Generally, they're they're placed within host nation bases. So we're seeing a, a growth in the number of bases uh, in Africa, also in Latin America. So at the same time that, that the United States is closing uh, many bases in, in Afghanistan um, and some in, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, we're seeing a growth in the, the number of bases, many of them these small, often referred to as lily pad bases. Uh, and there are a number of dangers with that this strategy, including the getting involved in conflicts that we don't know anything about, as we've discussed. Um, but also there's the potential, of course, for a small base to become something quite a bit larger, and that's exactly what we saw in, in Diego Garcia. It was pitched to Congress in the late 60s, early 70s as an austere communications facility. Now it's a multi-billion dollar base. Uh, so I think we shouldn't be fooled by um, the creation of, of bases when the, if they're just referred to as lily pad bases or cooperative security locations, those bases can become much larger and be the, the beginning of a much larger investment and, and involvement uh, of U.S. military power. And then at the same time, though, in the book, you quote him talking about, and I guess this is just the Air Force, saying, well, we can rule the world from Guam and Diego Garcia by 2015. We don't need all these lily pad bases all over Eurasia because they cause us problems. I mean, they're, they're recognizing the problem of uh, blowback and backdraft and all this great stuff and they're recognizing that you know it'd be easier if we just threaten everybody with our hydrogen bombs from our air bases and i guess you know tungsten rods from god yeah well i think there are a few things to be said about that first you know as, as we're trying to understand u.s military strategy and uh make sense of it and how it, it changes in the world we, we shouldn't uh, think or assume that it that it's all logical, um, and of course the U- the U.S. military and let alone the whole national security bureaucracy, it's huge, and and there are competing interests and different views and different strategies going on all at once that aren't necessarily coherent or logical. 
Um, so you, you, you do have some people in the, in the Air Force who say, you know, we don't need all these little bases around the world. Just give us, you know, three huge bases, Guam, Diego Garcia, maybe one or two in, in the States, and we can rule the world. But meanwhile, you know, there are people in the Army and the Air Force, the Navy, of course, who want far more bases, and especially the, the Army in, in, in places like Africa and, and the Marines to a lesser extent who are exploring the creation of these smaller bases. So you have multiple strategies going on at the same time. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. We're all out of time. we got to go. But thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate your time on the show. Thanks for having me, Scott. All right, that's David Vine. He's associate professor of anthropology. Why does the U.S. support the tortured dictatorship in Egypt? Because that's what Israel wants. Why can't America make peace with Iran? Because that's not what Israel wants. And why do we veto every attempt to shut down illegal settlements on the West Bank? Because it's what Israel wants. Seeing a pattern here? Sick of it yet? It's time to put America first. Support the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org and push back against the Israel lobby and their sock puppets in Washington, D.C. That's councilforthenationalinterest.org. Hey, I'll Scott here, hawking stickers for the back of your truck. They've got some great ones at libertystickers.com. Get your son killed, Jeb Bush, 2016. FDR, no longer the worst president in American history. The National Security Agency, blackmailing your congressman since 1952. And USA, sometimes we back Al-Qaeda, sometimes we don't. And there's over a thousand other great ones on the wars, police, state, elections, the Federal Reserve, and more at libertystickers.com. They'll take care of all your custom printing for your band or your business at thebumpersticker.com. Libertystickers.com. Everyone else's sticker. Suck. So you're a libertarian, and you don't believe the propaganda about government awesomeness you were subjected to in fourth grade. You want real history and economics. Well, learn in your car from professors you can trust with Tom Woods's Liberty Classroom. And if you join through the Liberty Classroom link at scotthorton.org, we'll make a donation to support The Scott Horton Show. Liberty Classroom the history and economics they didn't teach you. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson is a successful former hedge fund manager whose site is unique on the web. Subscribers are allowed a window into Mike's very real main account and receive announcements and explanations for all his market moves. The Federal Reserve has been inflating the money supply to finance the bank bailouts and terror war overseas. So Mike's betting on commodities, mining stocks, European markets, and other hedges against our depreciating dollar. Play along on paper or with real money, and then be your own judge of Mike's investment strategies. See what happens at WallStreetWindow.com. Hey, all Scott here. Man, I had a chance to have an essay published in the book Why Peace, edited by Mark Gutman, but I didn't understand what an opportunity it was. Boy, do I regret I didn't take it. This compendium of thoughts by the greatest anti-war writers and activists of our generation will be remembered and studied long into the future. You've got to get Why Peace. You've got to read Why Peace. It features articles by Harry Brown, Robert Naiman, Fred Bronfman, Dahlia Wasfi, Richard Cummings, Karen Gutowski, Butler Schaefer, Kathy Kelly, Robert Higgs, Anthony Gregory, and so many more. Why Peace? Because war is the health of everything wrong with our society. Get Why Peace. Down at the bookshop or Amazon.com. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org.